Okay, thanks very much for the nice introduction. So as you see, our presentation together is compiled of two components, one more engineering component, one social science component. Uh, this looks maybe a bit interesting in the first place, but uh, in the end, as you will see, uh, it's pretty much connected to one another. Because we talk about the same things, which is uh, risk, how to study risk. And I would like to start this uh, discussion, this presentation, with a kind of overview uh, why do we study this? What do we actually study? So the question is, what do we do? We study risk, and this is a multidisciplinary challenge and opportunity. So this, this means we have to look at risk, not only in one discipline, we look at risk across many disciplines. What we do in the Institute for Risk and Uncertainty is, we look at risk and uncertainty across eight disciplines. So the first question is, why do we do that? So this is pretty easy to explain. When we look at our projects in all the disciplines, not only in engineering, it's, uh, it's actually in all disciplines, they become more and more complex. So the complexity of our real world problems grows significantly and very quickly. And the problems in these big projects are pretty much interconnections between these disciplines. So that means to address all the issues of risk and uncertainty in our real world, uh, problems, we need to address these across the disciplines and not only in one discipline. So the second question is, how do we do that? When we only look into risk and uncertainty in one discipline, we will be lost very quickly. We have to understand first what do our colleagues in the other disciplines understand by risk and uncertainty. What does a psychologist understand when he says he talks about risk? What does an economist tell you when he talks about risk? And only when we can understand each other, then we are able to address our real world problems in this area. And to understand each other means something like to learn a different language. So when you look at these eight disciplines, you may wish to understand each discipline as a country in the European Union. And what we like to do is, in the Risk Institute, to form a kind of European Union for our disciplines. So to talk to one another, we need to learn the language of our partners first. And this is what I mean when I say we have to explore risk first in this intersection of these eight disciplines. When we do that, we will be able to understand each other, and then we will be able to do some research in the area of risk and uncertainty. But before we can do that research, we have to really understand one another. So we have some pretty big primary goals in this entire big setup of the Risk Institute. We would like to address these issues of risk and uncertainty with our research and develop new theories, methodologies, applications. So this is the theoretical, the pure kernel research part. But then we don't just do our research for fun. So we do it on purpose because we would like to address our real world problems. That means we would like to translate our research into practice. So we provide our research, consultancy, training, services, and so forth, to industry, to government, and so forth. That means we develop software, courses, we do consulting, we produce tailored PhD students, which are educated in between the disciplines. And we now have the first PhD students in place who are co-supervised between two, three, and more disciplines at the same time. So which works pretty well. Also, we do not only provide our services and research to the industry and government and so forth, we also deliver education, of course. Postgraduate education, which means on master and PhD levels. So we just implement a master uh, program in risk and uncertainty across all the eight disciplines. And of course, we educate our PhD students across the disciplines. In our initial year in the Risk Institute, some research focus areas have evolved, which, let's say, seem to be very fruitful for further consideration. So one is uncertainty quantification and robustness assessment, which is more quantitative and spans across all the disciplines. That concerns methodologies and techniques for estimation, processing, simulation, assessment of risk, and so on. And it includes software for industry and tools. Tools and software also, which we can use for all the disciplines in different areas within the Risk Institute. So we have 
this kind of developments, uh, software tools which we can use across all the disciplines. So we actually share a kind of common quantitative mathematical basis across all the disciplines. The second <coughs> one is financial and economical network analysis and banking risks, so which includes investment risks, stability, failure risks, and so on. But not only in the financial sector and in the economic sector, it's also <coughs> connected to environmental sciences. You see here, earthquake and tsunami risk. It's connected to structures and systems and engineering, because we have to think about the failure of these uh, structures and so forth. And insurance matters come in. Further on, from the social and psychological point of view, we have to think about are these risks which we have in engineering acceptable to the society and to the population? So these are bigger issues. Further, the communication of risk is extremely important when we work across the disciplines. So we have to translate the understanding of risk between the disciplines, but not only this, we also have to translate this to the societies and the authorities when it comes to these high-stake consequences, terrorism, disaster management, this kind of thing, we have to understand each other. We have to understand authorities, we have to understand the society, what kind of risk is acceptable, and translate it into now our engineering and mathematical analyses into numbers, and further on, translate the results of our analyses into an understanding so that the society can recognize what we actually do and how safe our structures and systems are. So these are very important things in the communication of risk. Further, we have the environmental risk and mitigation, which involves climate change, droughts, floods, again, connected to engineering, connected to uh, social sciences, everything. And project risk management, which includes human action, natural environment, and so forth, and the impact on construction processes, operation of products, and so forth. This may concern systems like nuclear power plants, this may concern also systems like an Airbus A380. So that can be anything. So these five research focus areas evolved over the first year. So just to give you a flavor what does what this means in more uh, technical context, is this specific uh, development we pursue, we build a network for uncertainty and risk quantification. Not only in the University of Liverpool, this is a network which we establish around the world. So we have uh, many partners. At the moment, we have uh, around 20 European partners involved, and some from the United States, some from uh, Southeast Asia, some from Japan. So we build up this network. And the idea here is to generate synergy on a common mathematical and computational basis, but with different but associated application areas. So it means we can actually share our quantitative tools among all the disciplines. So when we, and we do this in a global collaboration with academic and also industrial partners. And what you see here is just two examples, Swiss Day and car industry, of industrial partners, which are totally different in the first few. But they have, they have specific issues in common which we can address with our specific tools in uncertainty and risk quantification. So when we look at these pictures, we see two engineering structures. Here we have already a collapse. This may have a collapse in the near future when you look at these waves. So our question is, okay, what happens when such structure fails? It has some consequences. It has a, as a consequence, it has a breakdown of the electricity supply to the population. So we have to translate this kind of risk into the understanding of the society what happens when I have an electricity breakdown? When I have this uh, more frequently, it may affect the stock market. So we see effects here, which has to do with investment risks, banking risks, which is interconnected with the failure here. So we have to think about how can we make our structures safer to not have these adverse effects. So to make our structures safer, we have to think about our loads. So we have climate change, storms, floods, changing load patterns and so forth. So environmental sciences come in. So we have to interconnect with environmental sciences to better understand what kinds of loads can be expected in the next years to make our structure safer. So the question is, how safe should we make it? So we need the understanding of the society to put a level of acceptable risk in here. So to not over-design our structures because this costs too much. If it costs too much, we have to break down on the financial side again. So we have to be a bit careful when we do that. Okay, 
to build our structures robust and reliable, we need reliable structural analysis, which means a numerical analysis. So we need computer science to make our computations reliable. So we have round-off errors, all this kind of stuff, and uh, maybe soft computing methods. So, so we have to be careful about this to make sure that our calculations deliver the results we actually need. This is also connected to financial math, again, with the market, and it's also connected to economics, because these are big companies which are behind here. This is just a small flavor of uh, how all this is interconnected in the Risk Institute. So this goes already a little bit in the direction of engineering. Now I would like to come a little bit more to engineering to say something about how we address risk and uncertainty specifically in our, let's say, structural engineering field. So our general endeavor there is a numerical modeling of physical phenomena, the structure, and the environment to come up with a prognosis regarding system behavior, hazard safety, risk, robustness, but also economic and social impact. So to address this endeavor, our analysis must be close to reality and numerically efficient. So what happens in engineering is most of the analyses are done in a deterministic way. So the parameters and also our computational models are described in a, in a crisp, in a deterministic way. But we have to ask ourselves, how close is this to reality? In reality, we have phenomena such as uncertainty, fluctuations, variability, vagueness, imprecision, ambiguity, indeterminacy, and so forth. So when you look at the literature, you find at least 20 of these expressions. And nobody really knows some, let's say, definition for that. You find very much scattered. But when we, pursue, uh, when we perform our engineering analyses, we have to think about how we can address these phenomena in the analyses, and how can we translate it into the results. And further on, what are the consequences, and how can we use the associated results to make useful engineering decisions. So we have to think about how we can use these phenomena translated into the results, for example, for engineering design. The question which appears generally in engineering is, is the structure safe? So we can do such kind of analysis from the theoretical point of view. When we go back, collect some data, let's say these are our data, we have the bricks. When we have some data, we can uh, put up some probabilistic model with the aid of mathematical statistics and estimation and test theory. Once we have this stochastic model, we can perform a reliability analysis and calculate the failure probability. So this simple number is just a number which we calculate, tells us how safe our structure is given that this model is okay. So this is just a likelihood that our structure fails. So now we have to think about what does this number tell us? Is our model here reliable? Or when something is not reliable here, by how much would this change? And by how much would the interpretation change? So we have to think about does our modeling and analysis really reflect the reality? This is a big challenge in engineering. And when we take off our glasses, and then, this is what we see. This is reality. So our, our numbers do not come as numbers. We, of course, when, when we measure some uh, strength of materials, we, we make some reading. But this is, this is just an observation. This is a perception of the reality. And the question is, how good is the perception of the reality? What we actually want to do is, we would like to perform a realistic analysis. We would like to reflect reality. But what we get is only first a picture of the reality, an image. And the question is, how good is it? And this is actually the image we see. The question is, how can we translate this into our analysis and into the result and into the interpretation? So what we can do here, or what the, the question actually becomes then, is the reliability analysis still reliable? And what effects from here, from our reality, do we see in our numerical result? What we can do is, we can go to our colleagues from mathematics, and ask them for some help. Because what we do here in this phase is just we use mathematical models for an engineering purpose. So to do this in a better way, we have to talk to mathematicians to see if we can find a better way to do that. And what we did some years ago is we talked to them, we found a way to do that, because it is possible to take into account imprecise observations in some analysis. So you can find models, not just one particular probabilistic model, 
but we can find an entire set of models. And each of these models in this set of models may comply with the reality behind our observation. So we don't just deal with one particular model, which is more or less arbitrarily chosen. We deal with an entire set of models. And then it's possible to translate this imprecision from our initial observation into the result. And then we can see how sensitive our result is with respect to our imposition and uncertainty when we actually observe the reality. So this is a big challenge in engineering. So the, the work which is behind this one slide is about 15 years. So question is, where does this imposition in engineering actually come from? Most people think, okay, I can measure something, I get a number, I put it in my analysis, I get my result, and I'm happy and can sleep well. But that's not true. So, for example, for our offshore structures, it's important to know about the wave patterns in the ocean, the wave heights. So, in particular, for the extreme high waves, it's very difficult to measure them. I mean, if you have a boy there, you can imagine that the sensor may collapse when such a big wave comes. Also, what we get is, we don't have to poison the entire ocean. So we get measurements, which are estimations, uh, made by captains of a ship or so. So they observe this kind of wave, and then they give you a number. So, but is, is it a crisp number they can give you? How reliable is that number? Another thing is the typical engineering measurement of a water depth. So what, what is it? Is, is it a number? Is it a distribution function? Or just a range, something between A and B? Or when we measure the depth of these uh, dips in the street, in a typical engineering way. So there are different uncertainties and impositions here. I mean, I can, I can place this in a little bit inclined way or so. I get a different measurement. When I send five people there to do this, I get five different results. Is this uncertainty which I can model in a probabilistic way or not? What is it? So these are typical questions. Or so when I measure the opening of a window in this way, what is it? What engineers want to have is, or what we need is a modeling, quantification, processing, evaluation, and interpretation of this kind of stuff in some numerical analysis. And what engineers need is actually a model to do that. So we need to talk to mathematicians. And this is what we did. We went back to uh, the mathematics department, not here in Liverpool, that is in, uh, in Dresden, in Germany. So they talked to my colleagues, and then said, okay, uh, let's start with a traditional probabilistic model, where we have a random experiment here, observations here, and the outcome are just these blue dots. These are the numbers which we read in some sort of, uh, random experiment. And then we say, okay, our observations are actually not precise. What happens if our observations come as, as images which, which, which are some kind of fuzzy? How can we deal with that? Is there a mathematical model for it? So we found that there is a mathematical model for it, <laughs> which is relatively new, so which comes in, in this form. So when we observe our outcomes of an experiment of this axis, we get kind of imprecise ranges for our values. So that, that is what we get. And this is a mathematical model which we can then use for our engineering explanations. So there is, of course, some uh, mathematical stuff here, which we just need for numerical processing. So it's not necessary to talk about this. But we need a model. With the model comes uh, numerical handling of the, of the problem. And then we can implement it in some en engineering analysis. But then we are still not yet at the end. The question is then, what does this kind of model in an engineering analysis tell us? How can we use it? So then we come to this uh, kind of uh, interpretation here. But let's say we have um, a structural analysis. So we analyze the structure, and we would like to find the reliability for the structure. So this is one of the inputs. Input parameters can be a geometry, can be a load, something like that for a structure. So we analyze the structure. What we find in the result is the failure probability, which tells us how likely it is that the structure fails. Of course, what we want to have is, we want that the structure does not fail. This cannot be guaranteed in an absolute way. There is always a kind of remaining probability that we have a structural failure. But what we can do is to keep this small on an acceptable level. To find this acceptable level, again, psychology and social sciences come in. Because we, we have to define something. When we define an acceptable level that the structure fails, in, in any way we have to quantify the value for human life. How acceptable is it that someone dies from a collapse of a structure? So this is all in here when we define these values for an acceptable failure probability. 
Further, once we have found this, we have to make sure that our structure does not fail with probability higher than this acceptable level. So we want to make sure that our entire result, including all these uncertainties, is on the safe side in some sense. So what we have here is, for each of these intervals, these are all intervals, for each of these intervals in the input, we have an associated interval in the output. So in this way, we can do the following. First, we can say, if we don't know much at the beginning of the design of a structure, we can just model it in a very coarse way. So we can model it very roughly and see if the design is okay. If the complete design over a rough area of, of structural parameters is okay, I can choose any parameter out of here and the final design will be okay. Further, I can identify sensitivities. This interval is associated with this result interval. This input interval is associated with this one. When I go from here to here, the input grows a little bit. The result grows by a significant amount. So I have some sensitivities. So I can think about to exclude these sensitivities. Further, if my complete result, if, if my result is not completely in the safe zone, I don't have to throw it away. I find an interval, which would be okay. I can go back to the input, say, okay, I just need to make sure that my input is in this interval with my design, and then I'm okay. So I don't need to reanalyze, which is very costly. I can use this for robust design and acceptable uh, identification of an acceptable imposition of parameters and probabilistic models and, and all this. So this kind of uh, analysis can now be done for realistic structures. What we have done is, we have done this uh, for an offshore structure in the location in the North Sea. So here, many things are uncertain and imprecise. What we have done is we just focus on the corrosion model. Because corrosion is, is a process in, in the ocean which, uh, which drives the uh, failure probability up over time and the reliability down. So we looked at this. We just chose a probabilistic corrosion model which describes the corrosion process over time. So I don't want to talk about details here. The important is that this model has a parameter to adjust it to the particular location in the sea. So for this parameter, we have only a handful of measurements. So the guy who published these measurements lives in Australia. So probably the measurements come from that region. So when you now place your, your offshore platform in the North Sea, it, it, it might deviate a little bit from here. It's far away. So we have to think about how can we use this to make a reasonable prediction for the reliability of a structure in North Sea. So this is what we did for some uh, realistic structure. So we considered this, uh, uh, this corrosion process in an imprecise fashion. We took a large range of models for the corrosion or a large range of, of imposition to make sure that whatever we get, the structure is safe in reasonable ranges. So again, compare uh, probabilistic analysis with uh, <coughs> this improved analysis based on fuzzy sets and intervals, which we developed. And we see that the analysis with the intervals is the outer bounds, and we find with the interval analysis a kind of upper limit for the failure probability. When we just do, a, let's say, more traditional probabilistic analysis, we are somewhere in this range, and we don't hit the worst case with some benefit out of this analysis. Another application example is the uh, controlled demolition of a storehouse. Uh, of a storehouse. So it's collapse simulation. In our populated areas in the middle of the city, sometimes we have to blast some structure away. So let's say this building is about 100 years old. So it's uh, not so easy to find information about the material behavior and the material properties of this building. But this is what we really need to know to predict the collapse of the building when we blast it. What we do is we blast some of the columns down here and then the structure collapses. So we have to predict the mechanism of the collapse in a numerical simulation before we blast it. To do this, we need to know something about the material behavior. Now, of course, we can take samples, but if we take too many samples, we have to collapse for the, before the blast. <laughs> but that's not nice. So we are limited in some sense. Also, it's quite costly to take these samples. So that is that means we took a few samples and then modeled the material behavior with our new models, which take into account uncertainty and imprecision in a more relaxed way, and performed the analysis. Now it's 
it's important that the collapse of these members in the structure appears in the right sequence. If the sequence of collapse of the members swaps, we find a different kinematic collapse mode, and the structure may fall to the one side, maybe in the garden of your neighbor, and these guys may not be happy about that. So we have to be a bit careful about this. So with our new models, we can then find kind of a bunch of distribution functions, go in with a probability with which we accept that the building falls in the garden of our neighbors and find the collapse time of each member. And then we just look at the intervals of these collapse times for the members. And if they have some intersection, that means that the collapse mode can swap, the order can swap. So we have to be careful, collect more information. If this does not appear, we can blast it with no problem. So what we see in this kind of very rough overview is that uh, our study of risk is really a multidisciplinary challenge, but also an opportunity. We can really get out a lot. We have a rapidly growing dimension and complexity of our problems, which drives this research in a multidisciplinary way. And we have a need for a change in the strategy to approach risk not only one disciplines, but across the disciplines. A key here is multidisciplinary communication and collaboration. When we do that, we can just have great opportunities and mutual benefits based on a very small effort. So what we see here is some evolution. What we need now is also some evolution, but evolution in the research approaches, which means we really have to understand that our research has to be done in a multidisciplinary way to go a bigger step, a bit faster. So at this point, I would like to hand over to Gabe for the second part. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, thanks very much, Michael. Um, second half, just before I go into this, just one or two observations. I think uh, by the end of this session, what we'll, we'll find in relation to risk is that it's a, you know, it's a very broad church and there are many different languages of risk rather than, than one single language. Uh, so it's certainly a kind of stretchy concept, and that's something which I think is partly enabling in the sense that it can enable people to talk to one another, but it can also be a problem, it can also be disabling when two different languages meet together and, and disagree or don't come to the same conclusions. Um, so just in relation to, um, I think you talked about a little bit there about fuzzy logic, um, Michael. I mean, one of the things that I'll be talking about is fuzzy evidence. So whereas I think Michael's work is an attempt to, to kind of fix some of the risks and dangers and hazards, mine is more to kind of problematize some of the fixes that are made, but obviously make a completely different arena. Um, so I think I'll talk a little bit about the policy impacts um, of the turn to risk. So risk has become something which has become increasingly prevalent at the level of language, but also at the level of policy. Uh, and I think some of my work is an attempt to try and problematise some of those applications. And also to look at the way that, that, that risk can act as a, as a technology of regulation and social control. So the way in which um, the state or different independent organisations, corporations, can wield and deploy risk as a kind of objective technology. Um, and then to kind of try and debunk some of those objective applications. Um, so the thing I'll look at today is some of the limits to risk in, in the policy arena. Uh, and I'll talk about a bit of work I'm involved in at the moment um, with Sandra Waldman and Ms. Pinkfield around counter radicalisation So it's still in the fairly early stages, but um, I just want to talk, and talk about racial problems and issues around risk, uh, using that as a particular example. Just to kind of cast back a bit, um, I think that... The work that I've done previously has, has looked at different aspects of, of risk and the risk term. So I've looked at the way in which um, political discourses deploy risk, the way in which risk is used um, as a way of describing, analysing, uh, assessing particular events, um, the way in which the media represents risks, various risks, whether they be environmental risks, whether they be security risks, so how is risk framed, how is risk uh, set at an agenda level, and what are some of the problems and issues with that. I've also done some theoretical work where I've looked at the way in which social sciences has used risk, um, what particular theoretical approaches, what narratives of risk have emerged, and how has risk been used in risk analysis, and what are some of the problems and issues around that. The thing I want to talk about today is, is some of the, the later work I've been involved in, specifically around policy formation. So I think underpinning all this uh, are questions of ideology and power. Um, so my, my approach to risk, is, as you've seen already, is, is very difficult. Um, but I think there, are, there is a lot of common ground, particularly at the level of dealing with issues of risk and uncertainty. Some of the problems that ensue. 
Okay, so just to give you a bit of context um, on this work on radicalisation, it actually comes out of some work that's now completed uh, with Patrick McCall and Sandra Walkway. Um, we were interested really in trying to find out about some of the impacts and effects of risk regulation, um, particularly as it uh, was embedded within uh, counter-terrorism legislation. Uh, and we, we came out with uh, three papers that I'm happy to circulate if people are, are interested in it. One around uh, looking at issues around identity. So how does the risk regulation impact upon people's behavior, people's view of themselves and of other people? Um, how does it impact upon um, the way in which people feel surveyed? How does it impact upon the freedom of speech, the civil rights and liberties of particular minority groups? So in doing this research, we, we found there were quite a few unresolved questions. Um, and a lot of those questions were around, well, you know, how is dangerousness constructed? So um, the young people we spoke to, young British Pakistanis, thought very much that Muslims were being constructed collectively as a risky and dangerous group. Mm. And they felt that was quite unfair, because the basis of that judgment was a very, very small minority of people. Um, so from that, we, we picked up quite a lot of comments around radicalisation, around assumptions about vulnerable people, people who might be at risk of being radicalised, and other people who were seen as being potentially safe. So there's quite a lot of questioning came out of this, um, this particular research project. So we decided to follow it through and try and think a little bit more about this issue around radicalisation, in particular around some of the discourses which circulate, politics and the media, uh, importantly the evidence for radicalisation. So what do we actually know about radicalisation? Does it even exist? If so, what does it actually mean? Uh, and also some of the gaps uh, in the particular policy constructions around how we counter radicalisation. I'll come back to some of those uh, later on. So some kind of fairly foundational questions, I think, uh, at the level of risk. So which discourse of the risk are present and indeed absent in political debates of radicalisation? So what's, what's there, what's being constructed and what's missing? Who is it that's thought to be at risk, you know, who's vulnerable to radicalisation, and why so? Um, what are the risk-based strategies which are utilised in policy to counter radicalisation, so what's the evidential <coughs> basis for this, and how reliable is the evidence that's used? So there, there seem to be some fairly basic questions, and you would think that these would have been asked before policy was set. And in actual fact, it seems to be quite the opposite. Policy set, and then there's an attempt to kind of retro-engineer some of the evidence to fit, fit with the correct answers to these questions. So those are the kind of things that we're interested in. It's fairly early stages. Um, We've done some uh, comparative research, looked at policy documentation uh, from different countries, from Australia, from Denmark, from Sweden, the UK, and what we're finding are some patterns of, uh, quite worrying patterns of uh, citation, where each country tends to cite each other's security services report on radicalisation, but doesn't seem to have an awful lot of evidence about that. Um, and just to t take it back a little bit, I think some of this, uh, theoretically and conceptually, does harken back to, to particular uh, approaches. So both Beck and Baum have talked about this condition of nichedism, which relates to, to risk. This idea that we are increasingly finding situations of non-knowledge or not knowing, where you know the science might take us some of the way, or the evidence might take us some of the way, but we don't really know for sure. But we are almost, you know, almost find that we have to act, and certainly states find that they have to act or feel they have to act in situations of imperfect knowledge. So um, I've got quite a few disagreements with that. Um, but I think he's actually got something quite important here about this, this deadlock. So he talks about the gap between knowledge and decision. So situations where no one really knows the, the outcome at the level of positive knowledge, the situation is radically undecidable, but we nonetheless have to decide. So risk societies provoke an obscene gamble, a kind of ironic reversal of predestination. I am accountable for decisions which I was forced to make without proper knowledge of the situation. So I think he's identifying a very real problem there, for risk regulators in particular. And you, know, you have a bit of evidence, there's perhaps a pressure, or a semblance of pressure to act, but you haven't the evidence on which to act. So what do you do? Do you wait and do nothing? Do you wait until the evidence emerges? Do you go on the basis of previous evidence and information? Or do you act preemptively? Now the answer to that, of course, varies very much, depending upon which policy arena or, or policy domain you're, you're talking about. Um, in the area of terrorism, and I think an awful lot of this uh, regulation which is, has taken place, and you know, that, that's a very crude split there between those measures which are coercive and, and which are ideational, we could both of both. Um, but I think a lot of these coercive measures in particular 
have been based around the policies of preemption. So you intervene early because the situation may be very grave at the level of risk manifesting itself in harm further down the line. Um, interesting questions about why that happens in the context of security management in relation to terrorism. It doesn't happen in many other areas. Environmental management would be one example. Um, corporate crime would be another workplace harm and so on. So just to talk a little bit about these more ideational measures around um, counter radicalization and, and also to um, I guess question some, some of those measures. Here are some of the more hard edge preemptive interventions which followed on after 9-11, uh, which I'm sure you're aware, um, extensions of detention without charge, control orders now uh, disbanded of course, section 44, stop search powers dramatically scaled down because they're totally ineffective, uh, and also glorification of terrorism. So all these are examples of uh, legislation which was preemptive and preventative. Uh, and many of which have either been challenged in the, in the uh, human rights course or, or uh, simply been disbanded because they weren't effective. effective so. so this idea of radicalisation, now what's interesting to me is that I think a lot of the debate is founded on the principle that we can't understand what could drive somebody to use political violence to indiscriminately kill citizens, people they've never met, they don't know, they don't know about the politics, they don't know about the beliefs. So what is it that could make, this is the 7-7, uh, people involved in the 7-7 attacks, could make them do what they did? So there's almost like a clamour to, to find the magic bullet. Was it that they were vulnerable? Was it that they were marginalised? Did they have a lack of regular norms and values? Were they naive? Were they led by somebody else? Were they simply insane? You know, were they brainwashed through ideology? So there's been a real clamour and a real industry around trying to explain what it might be that make people do what they do. Now to my mind what's interesting is there might be some very rational reasons why people did what they did. We might not agree with them, but there might well be a political reason, a, a value system behind people using violence. Okay? Now I'll come back to that later on, but I think that there's been the assumption that you know, it would be because it's so inhumane to undertake a terrorist attack, then we have to explain, we have to find a way of explaining it where we can be content that we have a reason why people have done what they've done. So there's, there, it kind of strips people of their context. Yeah, it makes them into tabula rasa. <clears throat> so this thing, radicalisation, you know, emerged after 9-11, but certainly in the British context after 7-7. So the idea of homegrown terrorism. You know, how could you have a situation in which British-born people could kill other British people? You know, so these these individuals, again, the language is really interesting, were clean skins, apparently. Okay? Clean skins, and, you know, there's racial connotations perhaps there, but hadn't appeared frequently on the security radar. I think Sadiq Khan had the others have. Um, so it's become quite a, an important um, topic, and quite a lot of money has been directed towards countering radicalisation. However, if you try and pin down the definition of policy documents, it's incredibly difficult, really difficult. And um, we've looked across different countries to try and you know, find what we could. Um, I mean, here's a, an interesting one from the Dutch General Intelligence Service, which isn't atypical. So radicalization is the process of increasing readiness to pursue changes, possibly by undemocratic means, and to encourage others to do so. Now. If that is an adequate definition of, of radicalisation, and we kind of query the idea of undemocratic, I think we might argue that probably most of us at some stage or other have been involved, have been either radicalised or involved in radical activity. But this is a real problem because policy has been founded, but there's an imp imprecise definition of the subject area. Alongside that, you've got various groups who are active in this. So groups such as, you know, uh, in the past, such as the Quilliam Foundation. An awful lot of money has been directed toward them so they can pursue and promote counter-radicalisation. Yeah? Um, so there are stakeholders, there are turf makers, and there's a, a whole industry around counter-radicalisation. So a nice quote from a paper, which is in the, the current um, edition of Race and Class, um, Kanani, whose work is very strong, I think, on uh, counter-terrorism and counter-radicalisation. So he's talking about the way in which there's a kind of mini-industry involved in think tanks, uh, some terrorism studies departments, uh, which will remain nameless for now, but will probably come up later, uh, law enforcement, counter-terrorism units, and intelligence services. Okay, so there's an awful lot of interest outside 
you know, those are kind of solving a particular social problem, if you will. So, what about those explanations? What, what can we say based around the studies which have been done? Well, um, a lot of these appear, particularly the top two, do appear in policy documentation in, in different countries. Um, but they do also connect together. So whilst they seem to be distinct and set themselves up as distinct, they do have a lot of similarities in terms of the ways in which they explain radicalisation. So the Silver and, and Bart study um, talks about radicalisation as an ideological process. These are actually, interestingly, two NYPD senior intelligence agents. Um, so that you, know, you could argue they have something at the stake in, in the way in which they're constructing this particular problem. Um, those arguments around religion, um, which I think have been very much uh, picked up from the UK context, that there's some kind of contorted uh, religious cause, which is important. Those around it being a, a, a psychosocial condition, for example, in the work of uh, Walter Lecour, and others which are more based around uh, the formation of identity, particularly in a, in a collective setting, um, and that's typified by the work of uh, Victorovich and colleagues. So let's just focus on those top two uh, for a moment. Now, where's the evidence coming from? You know, how, how are people making these judgments and these models of radicalization? Well, I think as critical social scientists, we might have some questions. Classified reports, they become unclassified for people close to it. Intelligence services data, court reports and court data, alongside interviews with radical activists, however defined, convicted terrorists, and supposedly de-radicalized individuals. Now, to me, that doesn't seem a particularly firm set of um, sources, really, on which to, to form policy. Now, I think you would perhaps want to speak to people amongst the general population about their views, uh, to get some kind of understanding. Uh, I mean, just in terms of the evidence you might get, well, how reliable might um, evidence from convicted terrorists be? How reliable, indeed, might classified reports and intelligence services data be? Okay, so we can ask questions about the banks of data that are used in, in, in the original instance. Now this is the, the Silver and Bart model, obviously based on the kind of ideological course. You get the top, this period where everything seems to be pretty much hunky-dory, nothing much is going on, there's no exhibited pattern of strange behaviour, pre-radicalisation. Then you have a phase where people take on particular religious views. Okay, they, they identify themselves as being a radical, often in, in the cases which Silver and Bart use around uh, undertaking or um, going along with Salafist interpretations of the Quran, uh, engaging with radical Islamist philosophy and so on and so forth. They then become indoctrinated, okay, ideologically commit to a particular position, and then they are prepared for jihad. They have, they have accepted the need for political or religiously motivated violence in order to pursue changes. I'll leave that there for a minute. I'm sure we'll come back to it. Second example, which isn't unrelated, um, sorry, which is the, the Godstein, Ross and Grossman, um, they talk about a process of incubation. Now, this is quite common in this idea that, that there is a time where people are, are kind of behaving normally, but then they begin to take up different friendship groups. They have what's known as a, a crisis or an opening. So something happens in their lives that changes them, that changes their behaviour. So it opens them up to, to doing something which is radical, um, and obviously in this case is also risky and dangerous. So you also get this idea of a, an influence of charismatic leaders, um, religious elders and so on, um, the acceptance of Islamist ideology, exposure to jihadi propaganda, both in terms of books and internet websites and so on and so forth, uh, and individuals become convicted to the need for violence. So a kind of similar model, but different inflection. This obviously focusing more on um, theological causes. So, what happens then, on the basis of some of these reports, is that they, they start to form an idea of risk and riskiness, and what we might do to prevent the risk of radicalization. So again, in the same article, Kudnani, if a set of religious beliefs could be identified, 
that terrorists share with a wider group of radicals, but which moderate Muslims reject, however defined, then a model can be developed in which such beliefs are seen as indicators of radicalization. Okay, and that's where the risk factors come in. A point along the pathway to becoming a terrorist. Okay, so this logic has been, uh, has been very pervasive, but has also been quite attractive to policymakers and governments. Yeah, it provides them with a rationale, a model of behavior, which enables them then to point out that the interventions they make are necessary based on risky behavior. Now, how does that roll out in practice? Well, I'm just going to give some examples uh, from the UK, the Preventing Violent Extremism Agenda, which was um, first instigated by Tony Blair in 2007. Um, massive sort of program, uh, million, multi-million pound program, based as a, a kind of hearts and minds approach. The idea after 7-7 that we need to engage um, people, not just by coercion, but we need actually to engage the, the ideas and we need to counter the ideas that are forcing people to want to commit to political, political violence. So a lot of this was based as uh, building partnerships, so we give 50 million quid to various uh, local authorities with uh, relatively high uh, Muslim populations. Um, so that they could challenge radicalism, radicalism at the ground level, so kind of you know, root causes stuff. Um, now what's interesting at the level of risk is that one of the axial points of this policy was to try and determine those individuals that would be at risk of being radicalised. Um, and the policy, the preventing violent extremism policy, was driven by the notion of early intervention. You don't enable people to work their way along a particular continuum, formed by a risk model, you intervene early so that you can prevent and persuade and direct their behaviour elsewhere. Just one example here, there are, there are num a number of examples that we could use to problematise the, the, the construction of risk and application of risk. This is just one. So the channel project within the PVE uh, agenda basically trained teachers, youth workers and health professionals to try and identify at-risk individuals. The idea that you could uh, prevent people from being recruited by terrorists. And again, the word recruitment is interesting. You know, you've got war on terror and war metaphors and so on and so forth. Now, as a consequence of this, over a thousand vulnerable individuals were identified. Now, first of all, what were the markers on which those identifications were made? Things like changing friendship groups. Things like observing uh, people's changing views on politics, on religion. Now interestingly, a number of those, I think it's something like 350 of those were under 16, 55 of them were under 12. 90% of them were Muslims. Okay, so that raises some questions, I mean, methodological questions again, questions about human rights, questions about you know, uh, when and whether or how people should be invited to intervene in other people's lives, you know, all those kind of questions. Well, certainly there seemed to be, and this is the way it was interpreted by many um, uh, Muslims, was an attempt to kind of survey what's determined as a suspect population. Um, when you put that together with the more coercive measures, then you do get a situation in which a particular group are being discriminated against and persecuted. So, uh, Sami Shami Chakrabarti, sorry, um, the director of Liberty, referred to um, the Prevent uh, Gender in the Channel project as the biggest spying program in Britain in modern times. Now, a lot of this PVE stuff has, has been uh, suspended and scaled down. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that's been because the methodology or the methods or the interventions have been flawed. I think there's been quite a lot of economic consideration factored into that particular agenda. Um, now, problems and issues, just to kind of draw this together a little bit. The first is that there's an awful lot of industry out there, there's a lot of money sloshing around, um, but not a lot of evidence. So it doesn't seem to me to be a lot of credible evidence that's informing policy. There's an awful lot of um, judgments being made. So whether or not somebody is radical or radicalised is subjective, it's evaluative, it's relational, it's not absolute. But there's been an attempt to make absolute markers so that interventions can take place. 
So there's an awful lot of merged assumptions going on. What Mandel refers to as simply what goes on before the bombs go off. So I think there is some attempt to try and scientize this. You know, if we, if we have this thing called radicalization, if we can identify it as a process, then we have an explanation for this bit. And then we can try and make um, incursions and interventions. What's dangerous to me, I think, is it offers an illusion of understanding uh, when the understanding is not there. Uh, and I think that's problematic um, because the policy is inaccurate and it also comforts people in a way which I think is not altogether healthy. Certainly in the UK, um, we've had an emphasis on, on theological contortions. So it's been about people accepting various uh, contorted or warped, in David Cameron, Cameron's words, versions of Islam. Um, and I think what that does is it, it denies some of the very uh, perhaps real problems and issues which Muslims face, uh, not just in Britain, but also in other countries across the globe. And I'll come back to that just in a minute. The other thing it does is it, it fix, fixes on Muslim extremism. If you read the policy documentation, there is some reference to uh, right-wing extremism. There is some reference to, um, to um, people who are continuing uh, to follow the path of violence uh, around six uh, counties in Northern Ireland, but most of it is based around Muslim extremism. Now, you know, um, questions might be asked at the more international level yeah, about this character. He seemed to me, if you look at what happened, if you look at some of the court data, there were all sorts of clues, cues, that could and should have been picked up on, but they weren't. And the very basic question would be, if Barry Braden were a Muslim, and had done exactly what he did, and purchased all the stuff from where he did, and exhibited patterns of behaviour, posted things on the internet, would he have gone beneath the security radar? Okay, so has the kind of fixation with Muslim extremism meant that you know, far-right groups, which are, are gaining purchase at the level of members and also presence in many European countries, you know, if you look at countries such as, as Greece, um, obviously the situation in, in the UK is thankfully more, more disparate, um, but you know, is, it has that lens produced a, a skew um, that has actually exacerbated rather than reduced the risk. Now, some of the things that we found in the initial tranche of data, and we're going to go back in um, and, and look at that data, and also um, perhaps run some more focus groups and interviews, was a strong feeling that there were many elephants in the room that just couldn't be discussed. So if you look at policy on, on radicalisation, what's interesting is that a lack of reference to this stuff. You get little bits of this here and there, but it's referred to as perceived injustices. Yeah? Not injustices, the way in which people perhaps have wrongly perceived injustices in the past. So, you know, things like Western imperialism, histories of cultural imperialism across the globe, neo-colonialism, particularly if you think about the idea of the, you know, the Yuma. Foreign policy, present and past, particularly present, obviously, if you think about Iraq and Afghanistan. Military interventions, routine racism, discrimination, and inequality. So to me, those might be important drivers for people who decide to commit political violence. Yeah? And what's interesting is that if you engage with the legitimation of people who have done that, then some of those things seem to be quite clearly expressed. Yeah? We may totally disagree with them, but they are nevertheless there. So the rationale here you know, talks about atrocities against Muslim people all over the world. Okay. Protecting, revenging Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, we will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment, and torturing my people, we will not stop this fight, etc., etc. So if policy is going to be accurate, if it's going to be effective, it has at least to examine some of the problems and issues. Yeah? It has at least to look at some of the drivers underpinning people's resistance, um, people's um, attraction to radical philosophies, however we define radical. Now again, just some, I mean, some, I suppose, you, some caveats on this, the time it was taken and also the question that was asked. Um, but one-fifth of the respondents, British Muslims, had some sympathy with the feelings and motives of those that carried out the London attacks. Yeah? Um, so if that is accurate, it would be representative of about 350,000 British Muslims. So what's happening, I think, in, in the whole debate about radicalisation is, is a kind of conflation of what might be determined as radical 
views, which we might well disagree with. We might think these are very reasonable and rational views, given what's happening on happening in the world, geopolitical level. Um, so the conflation of um, radical views, oppositional views, and violent methods. And they seem to be, to me, to be kind of rolled together. So just to conclude then, um, returning to policy and, and radicalization, what's required, I think, is, a, is an objective primary empirical foundation, which there just doesn't seem to be. I'm quite happy to be proven wrong, and I'm hoping that we will find the, you know, the, the fantastic, thorough, you know, uh, comprehensive and methodologically rigorous study out there, but certainly the policy documentation we haven't found it so far. So rather than evidence-based policy making, we've actually got policy-based evidence making. We've got a lot of citing uh, between and within different countries and security services in the area. Now the wider picture, I think, is that um, counter-radicalization policy is taking to place within a, a broader uh, climate of suspicion. Uh, so the coercive tendencies in counter-terrorism law and policing and surveillance have meshed together with what was supposed to be this kind of like softer measures to encourage people to think in a particular way. Um, certainly all of this has restricted the capacity um, of Muslims and young Muslims in particular to express what are legitimate political views, for example about the situation in Palestine, about Iraq and Afghanistan. And those, those kinds of views we found in, in the first study we did, uh, young Muslims were quite um, you know, felt they couldn't express those very vocally in public. And if they did, that they would be treated very differently from a white British non-Muslim colleague. So the question then at the, the level of policy making is, you know, uh, is this effective? Does this reduce risk, or does it actually generate a whole set of, of, of other risks? So um, Felgar Nielsen refers this to, to this as kind of iatrogenic policy. Um, Sandra and I have talked about the law of inverse consequences. Uh, same kind of thing, you know, you, you intervene formally to produce a particular effect which is supposed to alleviate the situation, and in so doing you actually exacerbate the situation. And that remains an open question, the extent to which um, these kinds of policies have, have increased or decreased the actual risk of, 